All right, so picture this. Mm -hmm. You could buy a brand new car for $525. Okay. Congress ratified the 19th Amendment, which would soon give American women the right to vote. Go women. <laughs> Most of the Grand Canyon was established as a U.S. national park. And the latest telephone technology, the dial phone, <laughs> was introduced by AT&T. What year was this? We won't leave you in suspense. <laughs> it was 1919. And do you know what else was introduced? What? Veterans Day. Mm. Originating as Armistice Day on November 11th, 1919, this was the first anniversary of the end of World War I. Congress then passed a resolution in 1926 for an annual observance. And by 1939, November 11th became a national holiday. Now, unlike Memorial Day, Jefferson, Veterans Day pays tribute to all American veterans, living or dead, but especially gives thanks to living veterans who have served their country honorably during war or peacetime. Right. So this is our Veterans Day special mm -hmm. in honor of those who serve. So hey everyone, welcome to Crazy Amazing Humans podcast. We hope you're all doing well. And that everybody is safe and sound out there. Yes, and I'm Katrina Carlson. And my name is Jefferson Denham. We're hard at work on upcoming podcast episodes and we're really excited to share them with you. The first of which launches next month. We are really super excited about that. Uh -huh. So in honor of this being Veterans Day, we are sharing our episode about veterans entitled Those Who Serve, and what better way to honor our vets, right? Right. So we believe it is just as timely now as when we first aired it. Right. And in this episode, we speak with filmmaker Jeff Werner about his film Those Who Serve. This important documentary shines a light on the issue of veterans who come back from multiple tours of duty suffering from post-traumatic stress and the impact of that on their lives and on the lives of others. Right. We'll also be speaking with veteran Mark Stallion, one of the veterans yes. featured in the film. A warning before we begin, this episode features some war themes and adult content. I want you to feel, I want you to feel something crazy, crazy, amazing. I just killed my friend and I don't even know why. In 30 seconds, everything just changed. 30 seconds. I was lost in, in a combat mindset where I was back at war. There is a significant minority of veterans who come home with post-traumatic stress, bringing their war home with them and acting out against their communities. You will stop acting like a jerk. It's difficult to understand the war hero who comes back and becomes a criminal. After he came back from war, he still smelled dead bodies. He started hitting his head with both hands. I was blown up a couple times. I hit a couple of IEDs. The DA is never gonna understand that. I felt uh, he squeezed the trigger. It was like you were looking into the eyes and they were hollow. You need to treat this. If you don't, the behavior's not gonna change. We do a good job of training them up but we don't do a very good job of bringing them back down. The question is, should murder by someone who suffers from PTSD be treated differently than someone who doesn't? He didn't look good when he came home. He wasn't the same child. Why do such strong individuals crumble? This case should never have happened. When you're aiming this K-bar knife toward your friend, are you trying to kill him? PTSD is a handicap for the defendant. I know in my heart that he didn't mean to do that. With PTSD, we may have a time bomb. I don't want to be remembered for the things that I've done in the past five years. So my life is going to change, I hope. I want to be somebody who's remembered for the things that I do the next 30 years. Do you still swear that the testimony about Our military take an oath to serve. And I think we should take an oath to serve them. Our guest today is Emmy Award winning documentary filmmaker, editor, director, producer, Jeff Werner. 
Jeff's career has spanned over four decades in the film industry. He's worked on projects with such diverse subject matter as Mormon comedy troupe, the art and life of artist Francesca Woodman, several Barbara Streisand movies, and was a producer on the award-winning film The Heart of Nuba. His latest project is entitled Those Who Serve, the trailer of which we just played. The feature-length documentary is a compelling and personal look at three psychologically wounded American combat vets who have committed crimes since returning to civilian life and focuses on how that plays out through the criminal justice system. Jeff Werner, welcome to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast. Thank you very much. Good to be here. I'm a little bit shocked by the four decades, but I guess that's what it's been. God. Wow. That's nuts. That's and awesome. That's a long time. And okay. so going all the way back to when you were teaching fourth and fifth graders in Harlem, New York, can you tell us a little bit about that? I'd left college and had um, always wanted to do some kind of um, educational work of some sort. And uh, there was a program in, back in those days um, that was called Urban Core, and it was set up for college graduates who did not have a degree in teaching to get their master's while they taught. And we actually team taught. There would be two of us at a, in a classroom. And um, I loved it. It was a major part of my life, and I got my master's, and uh, I taught for two years in Harlem and had fourth and fifth graders. Actually, the interesting thing, we'd, we took the fourth grade class with us to fifth grade, so oh, which is an unusual oh, thing, nice. so the kids had the same teacher in the same classroom for two years running, and I think it helped them sort of um, be open to more learning because there wasn't anything new going on. Right. They Trust. knew what fifth grade was going to be. Mm -hmm. They knew what the class was going to be like. Mm -hmm. They knew their classmates and they knew their teacher. Um, anyway, and then they had a cutback in funding in, in New York at that time. And um, the union, the teachers union, then got rid of, by seniority, everybody who didn't have any seniority. We had no seniority. Mm -hmm. And so we were let go. And then I moved to San Francisco and taught in San Francisco for a while. There was an organization there called the Multi Multicultural Institute, which was a wow. unique school for that time that Mayor Aliota had actually set up. And that was a, um, the idea with that was kids from all different cultures would go to the school, it was a public school, but they're all different cultures. And the morning were academics, typical reading, writing, arithmetic. And in the afternoon, there were cultural studies. Mm. And um, wow. so that was really interesting. And then I got into, f I wrote a script and decided to get into film. Wow, so that's amazing. First of all, you saying that you wanted to be teaching in some way, I would say, mm -hmm. Kat, that he's mm -hmm. still teaching through his yeah, films. Yeah, that's true. So how did you make that transition? I mean, mm -hmm. from teaching to filmmaking, I mean, what, oh, okay, so this is a two-parter, and then your life experiences teaching and otherwise. How does that inform your filmmaking now? You know, I would say that uh, ideally when I got into film or when I thought about getting into film, um, I, I was hoping that it was going to be an educational slash political experience. Um, I kind of um, had from m probably my junior year in, in college taken a political bent and was interested in trying to promote certain ideas in terms of um, society and improving the lot of people who have less and whatnot. Um, and so there was a political motivation behind my teaching, and um, also in terms of when I went into filmmaking, I actually had hoped, as you pointed out, Jefferson, that there would be a, an educational aspect to making these movies or making movies mm -hmm. that were about something. Mm -hmm. um, I, I basically, I wrote a script that was a, uh, you know, amateur script. Um, I knew uh, somebody in New York I was living in San Francisco at the time, but I knew somebody in New York who knew this guy, Douglas Sirk. And Douglas Sirk was a prominent German director who came to Hollywood in the 40s, directed a lot of wonderful melodramas with Lana Turner and whatnot. And uh, I asked that person to send Douglas Sirk my script and to see what he thought of the script. And the script was this really impressionistic <laughs> crazy silly <laughs> political <laughs> thesis he gave the script to douglas sirk douglas sirk said please don't make me read the script <laughs> it's not going to be any good 
And I would never advise anybody to ever go into the business anyway. So, you know, just don't make me do this. <laughs> and my friend came back and said, he really says, don't, you know, don't do this. He doesn't want to do it. And I said, well, just try to get some kind of, so I can get an inkling as to whether I'm in the ballpark. Anyway, he persevered. Douglas Sirk read it. Douglas Sirk said, eh, it's actually not so bad. And I took that as a endorsement. Oh, right. yeah, I'm and in. I, I, right. moved, I moved down to Los Angeles and got into film. Oh, that's interesting. So so now we're here. You've just made this film, Those Who Serve. It's definitely a compelling and Ooh. timely topic. What drew you to this subject? I had done a film um, called Camp Scott Ladies for MTV, which was a film about criminal camp. And uh, Camp Scott's the name of the camp. And it was for girls who had committed crimes everywhere, anywhere from drug dealing to assault. And, um, but teenage kids, teenage girls. And we had been introduced to the camp there, and we d- we were doing a film. This is a, another filmmaker friend uh, from Washington D.C., and I were making this film. And somebody connected to that film mentioned to me that uh, this gentleman Paul Fries, who used to work at Public Counsel, which is a free legal counsel here in town, um, wanted to take me down to see this veterans court in Orange County. Uh, a woman named Judge Lindley ran this court where they had veterans come in who had committed crimes, and instead of being punished and sent to prison, um, they were given treatment, and they were given mentors that mentored them. And um, we went down there one day, and it was an incredibly moving and and touching day and experience in the courtroom. And um, on my way back, I talked to Paul, and I said, you know, What happens to some of these veterans who commit something that's not a misdemeanor or a minor crime? What if it's a capital crime? And he said, well, I have no idea really how that would be handled because capital crimes are not covered by veterans' courts. And then I found out that there are veterans' courts all throughout the country and that they're growing by leaps and bounds, fortunately, because it's something that's obviously very necessary. But anyway, I thought if I could find a capital crime done by a veteran who was also going to plead innocent by, or not guilty by reason of insanity or were using his PTSD or traumatic brain injury as part of his defense. That could be very interesting. And when I went into looking into it and I saw the numbers of veterans returning who are suffering psychological mm-hmm. trauma from their combat, um, it was astounding. If we have three million or so who have been fighting in these wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, there are about 600,000 who have returned with traumatic brain, well, actually 300,000 with traumatic brain injury, but 600,000 with PTS. So, um, and they very often are not treated and don't get treatment and very often therefore wind up committing crimes. So uh, I thought that that was an interesting premise for approaching an, an issue and a problem in the country that people don't really know about, bringing it to light, and hopefully getting a discussion started about how we can improve the criminal justice system to address these veterans who have risked their lives for us and in turn come back unalterably changed by their combat trauma mm. and then wind up committing crimes against us. Mm. Mm-hmm. Wow, and so that's, I mean, that's a story that most people you know, I think when you take public opinion polls, we've yeah. seen that, you know, everyone's for veterans, of course. Yeah. But are we willing then, as you're articulating, to do what's necessary to help mm-hmm. them then when they come back? And there was a compelling mm-hmm. scene in your film about that. Um, we're curious, why did you go through, because this film is funded mm-hmm. through Kickstarter, right? Mm-hmm. Part of it is funded through Kickstarter, yes. I, I basically shot uh, and directed and produced the filming of the film, the production of the film. So that was just my own, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. The Kickstarter enabled us, along with some other contributions, to um, actually do the post-production of the film. Gotcha. And so that whole process of going through Kickstarter, I'm imagining that means that you're keeping the controls. It's more of an independent... I would say, yeah, it's a very independent... With, you know, with a lot of help from a lot of people, but but very independent... (laughs) film, which uh, any kind of independent documentary these days with the um, Marvel 
you know, <laughs> franchise and that kind of stuff going on. It's gonna. It's very tough to make mm -hmm. these days. Although there are many, many more platforms than there ever used to be. So, one's hopeful that your film will get out somehow. Right. And so you've had to do this like because you have a passion for it because you care about the issue. And when we wanted to make you a crazy amazing human and you were like me what me I'd be so humble. You're like, "Look, I'm a filmmaker. I'm not an activist, but I just want you ad to address that and why your distinction of that, but then again, you've said you want to educate. Just tell us a little bit about well, that." I would say I'm 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 a filmmaker as a filmmaker and I'm trying to make good films that um enlighten and move people mm -hmm. uh i'm on, as a private person i'm an activist okay so i'm right. separating the two things i don't believe I the films should de be necessarily propagandizing anything or promoting um what, my side right necessarily. your side I, I believe if presented um fairly mm -hmm. that the audience will see my side mm -hmm. right. they may not buy it but they'll at least see the side they'll see the side yeah that you're... and and this is like a in this particular film, this is like a, a film that's, or this is a problem, it's not new. Mm -hmm. So there are very often people come up to me after they've seen it and they said, you know, I think my dad had PTS. And I think my grandfather may even had it when he fought. Because this is something that's been around since Homer. I mean, mm -hmm. the, Homer wrote about the psychological traumas of battle. And we used to call it, I think in the... In the 17th century, they used to, the French called it um, maladie du, du pays, which was like a homesickness. The Spanish called it like um, estar roto, being broken. But what they were talking about was a psychological issue yeah. that was then shell shock and then combat fatigue for World mm, War II right. and, and Korean War. And only like in 1980 did PTSD become actually a mm. term mm -hmm. that we realized probably a third of Vietnam veterans went through. And we just wow. didn't know. Yes. So that's we didn't know yeah, and we, sure. we ignored it. Right. And we treated veterans so horribly. I mean, in, after World War I, very often after every war, there is a um, increase in crime from returning veterans. Mm. Uh, it's documented this is the case. In, in World War I, we ignored them completely and very often put them into sane asylums with places where people were just treated horrendously. Wow. Um, it was the beginning, actually, of the GI Bill started, actually, originally the sort of the beginning embryo of it started after World War I uh, to be finalized after World War II. But uh, this has been around for a long, long time and ignored for a long, long time, either because of the stigma. Um, veterans feel that they don't want to be known for it, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It affects their careers as soldiers. Um, but also I think the military has not wanted to promote that idea that some of their heroes are returning home and becoming criminals. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's something that's not you know way out in the open in terms of the public, but needs to be. So yeah. these are things that I certainly didn't know and we were curious mm -hmm. what other things and for our audience too what are some things that you discovered in the making of this film that uh, you, people just don't know about I mean that's some of it obviously right yeah I mean I think a lot of it has to do with um, the recent I mean we have to establish that the Vietnam veterans really went through hell and and suffered this and were pretty much ignored for it which is our fault um, nowadays, there's so many different factors that, that lead to this uh, continuing and increased number of people suffering, veterans suffering from psychological problems after a return from combat. So you have um, wars that have been going on nonstop basically since 2003 in Iraq and Afghanistan. You have numerous deployments. So veter veterans Multiple. who have done numerous deployments, and there's proof that with every increased deployment, the greater chance of some kind of psychological trauma from combat. Um, you have the ability nowadays to, um, because of the medical uh, advances, you can get into the field of combat and save soldiers who used to pre pass away and die. Those people are coming back with traumatic brain injuries or severed legs or having seen horror uh, in combat but saved 
themselves mm-hmm. because we're able to evacuate them so quickly and deal with them actually even on the field with medical advances. Um, so all these factors are kind of adding to the making this actually uh, something that's not just a small issue, but something that's actually, as we bring soldiers home from Iraq and Afghanistan, it's going to only be more and more young men and women who are coming back with traumas. Yeah, and and here we want to bring in um, someone who was in your doc- one of your subjects of your documentary, Mark Stillian, and we're going to show a clip with him in that in your film right now before we bring him in. Great. The first deployment was very intense. It was very. Um, I mean, I was blown up a couple times. I had a couple IDs, IEDs, uh, roadside bomb, basically. I don't really, um, I don't really talk about much of it. I don't even like to think about it, you know, let alone talk about it, really. I've experienced, you know, firing a main gun round and into a group of military-aged males and destroying a target that way. I've, 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 I mean, basically, I, I saw um, war. I saw war at, at the front line. I do hereby publicly honor and command Lance Corporal Mark Allen Stillian for his service to our nation in the United States Marine Corps. After the Marine Corps, I, um, I took on um, contracting jobs with the Department of Defense, and I, I, I went the first time, and I felt more comfortable when I arrived than I did back at home. I felt like, like I knew what to do there. Look at this guy right here. Be somebody like him when you grow up, okay? Amen. I just felt more comfortable there. Okay, so that was a clip from Those Who Serve, showing a part of Marine Mark Stillian's story in the film. Mark Stillian, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let me just start with telling you how grateful we are for your service to our country. There is no greater sacrifice than putting your life on the line for your country, and we could never repay you for that, so thank you. Thank you for your support. Of course. And let's see. So you served in the U.S. Marine Corps. You've done multiple tours of duty and left as a sergeant. You were nominated Veteran of the Day. And in November 2007, the Sebring mayor awarded you a plaque of proclamation for your service to your country. Wow. Oh, but, yeah. but, oh, okay. Kat, there's more. Yes, there is <laughs> you more. You were also a certified combat lifesaver. You received the Iraq Campaign Medal with two bronze service stars, mm-hmm. the Combat Action Ribbon, Service Deployment Ribbon, Second Award, and National Defense Service Medal. You also earned the Rifle Qualification Badge Expert Second Award and Pistol Qualification Badge Sharpshooter. Well, I think I should just make an action figure out of you. (laughs) Yes, you Uh, should. So, Mark, (laughs) okay, so you're from Sebring. You're from a town in Ohio named Sebring, Ohio, obviously. That's correct. Um, I'm also from Ohio. I was born in Worcester. I don't know if you know where that is. That's not too far away. Hey, hey, go Buckeyes. Yeah, Buckeyes. (laughs) And you're married to... (laughs) <laughs> O-H-I-O. Uh, and we're going to do the script Ohio in just one second. But uh, what was, so what was your life growing up in um, Ohio? My life growing up uh, was, was pretty exciting for the most part. I grew up next to my two older brothers. Uh, uh, for the most part, you know, we hung out, just the three of us, um, you know, just normal kid stuff, I guess, uh, street hockey, uh, stuff like that. Uh, when I turned uh, 14, I began uh, traveling abroad, going on mission trips. And stuff like that so um i did that all through my high school years and um where'd you go where'd you go you went to some interesting countries all over yeah so i went to uh the first trip i went to was in south america i went to panama uh with an organization from texas called global expeditions and after i came back from that trip uh i was just completely my life had just been changed because of the culture shock that i experienced there just a whole different way of life that i'd never even known about and i I felt the uh the urge to want to help you know to be of service to other people so i went i went on another mission trip to australia and new zealand the following summer and i was gone for a month that summer and after that i went to uganda we did a 10-day medical mission uh in the hills of jinja 
Uganda. Wow. This That's is so all before he was 18. This is all wow. before. That's crazy. That's amazing. And then what drew you to the military and joining the military? It sounds like you have a heart for service, you know? Yeah, I was actually uh, planning a trip to Sri Lanka right after the tsunami hit uh, when I enlisted in the Marine Corps. I, I canceled that trip to go to the Marine Corps instead uh, just for the same reason, you know, just I wanted to be of service. And I, I felt like, uh, I, I mean, I've always had a a heart for p other people to help other people and uh you know I, I did it you know in my hometown I, I ran blood drives um food drives and stuff like that and I continued that in the Marine Corps I felt I felt like that was the best place after 9-11 you know I felt like the the Marine Corps was the best option for me what year did you join I enlisted in the Marine Corps in 2005 okay. and I, I left for boot camp uh 10 days after I graduated uh, High school in 2006. Were you still 17 wow. at that point? I was 17 when I enlisted. Wow. Whoa. Yep. So, okay, in the Marines, uh, I think we know the audience probably knows one mm -hmm. tour of duty, and we were talking about multiple tours of duty. One tour of duty would be intense. Mm -hmm. You did four. Mm -hmm. Hold on. <laughs> I want you to obviously tell us about that because that's a, that blows my mind. Yeah. Can you okay? So can you give us a picture of what kind of pressures and stresses you were experiencing while you were deployed, or even in the aftermath when you got out of the mili military? Yeah, um, you know, leading up to my first deployment, I, you know, was treading upon new ground. I had no idea what to expect. Um, and the first deployment when I went to Fallujah in 2007 was the worst deployment that I ever experienced. The enemy activity was very kinetic, kinetic every day, and we took a lot of. Uh, we had a lot of incidents during that deployment. Uh, or actually, after I came back from that deployment, I, everybody in my family noticed changes in my in me when, after I came home that I had never really noticed in myself. So um, every deployment is different. Um, the second deployment I went to Iraq um, was a little bit less um, intense, but it's, nonetheless was still in a combat um, combat zone. It was still in combat action theater. And um, the third and fourth deployment were actually as a civilian contractor with the Department of Defense. Uh, the third one, I went to Baghdad as a guard supervisor. And the fourth deployment, I was in Afghanistan for a year as a UAV operator. Wow. So, but it, always surrounded by this intense yes. threat of violence. Every, every deployment had its own threat, you know, but um, there was always a constant uh, imminent danger everywhere I went. Um, it just differed. Wow from place to place. So our, our audience is probably familiar with the term PTSD, but I understand now it's referenced mostly as post-traumatic stress or PTS to sort of take the disorder aspect of it because it's just, this is what what you're experiencing, correct, Mark? So um, you've got the multiple tours of duty issue and that would, you know, can you guys uh, expound a little bit about how that might, you know, create worse post-traumatic stress, these multiple tours and how many, like the percentage of people who suffer from that? Well, I think they've um, been statistically proven that um, more uh, soldiers return with psychological injuries than actually wind up being killed. There are more, more psychologically injured veterans than fatalities in a war, and they come back um, with various different types of um, uh, combat trauma um, Mark had a particularly, as we describe in the film, a, a complex PTSD situation. Um, and uh, he was afraid to ride in buses, and he was afraid of, paranoid about people and paranoid about wherever he went. And he could describe it a little bit better, but it involves night terrors and, and horrible nightmares and flashbacks. But you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so, like I said earlier, um, I. It was very difficult for me to notice any of my own PTSD symptoms, and when I did notice it, uh, it's not something I would want to come out and openly admit to. You know, it's there's a very uh, a negative stigma that's attached to that for veterans, and so when I did start to realize that what was going on in my life, I didn't really um, come out forward and just ask for help right away. You know, I, I tried to um, you know deal with it on my own by self medicating, but really the the main symptoms that I was experiencing were night terrors. Uh, flashbacks, um, hyper arousal. You know, I couldn't be in any crowded places. I couldn't sit with my back to the door. I couldn't ride on a bus uh, due to a, um, an experience that I had in Fallujah in my first deployment in 2007, um, which um, just really 
put a fear inside of me that that wouldn't even lie. I I was forced to get on a bus once and I had an anxiety attack and I couldn't I couldn't ride. So ever since then I just I just gave up on it, you know, until until later. Um but PTSD symptoms can range, you know, from, from a lot of different things depending on the veteran. Um but for me, um that that's basically what they were. Um and the, the self-medicating I was talking about, that was my go-to thing for for my night terrors, you know, I started using street narcotics to, uh, so I didn't have to go to sleep at night and t- that would, you know, take care of that. So it would keep you up. All keep night. me awake. Yeah. Uh-huh. The, the thing that I found and that I found hard to even <clears throat> uh, appreciate when I was first starting the film, it sounds so melodramatic. The idea that you have flashbacks and you have night terrors and you can't go into a bus and a loud backfire from a car all of a sudden makes you hit the ground which are all reactions to this trauma, this combat trauma. Mm-hmm. And I initially was not skeptical, but I was, it was like, it just felt too movie-like. It felt too mm-hmm. melodramatic. And it turns out that they're so real and so mm-hmm. true and so um, uh, exactly what goes on with the psychological damage that has happened to these men and women. In the Marine Corps, and all branches of the service, really, from the time you enter boot camp all the way until you get out, you're constantly drilled, you know, certain protective measures to, um, you know, when something happens, do this. And it's, it becomes second nature to us, you know. We're trained in boot camp for, you know, in the Marine Corps, we go through 13 weeks of basic training. And during that 13 weeks, you know, we are completely brainwashed and we're completely transformed into a, a killing machine, you know, basically. And uh, what they don't do is they don't, uh, well, we talk about this in the film a little bit. They don't, they don't, they don't bring us back down from that high level of hyper hyperarousal that kept us safe in combat. It, it's actually um, working against us here, and so um, we are, you know, just using the, as we the skills that we were trained to um, survive in combat, and those um, are still clicked on when we come back home. They, they don't, they don't do anything to uh, bring us back down. So that's where a lot of us are running into the problems that we're running into today. So let me segue off of that and just uh, ask both of you. I'll start with you, Jeff. With Mark and the other two veterans in your film, what are the actual legal challenges and realities of trying to deal with crimes committed by returning soldiers with post-traumatic stress? Well, one of the things that, um, one of the problems uh, is on the veteran side, that they don't report themselves as having problems, and so they don't seek help. Um, very often, if they wind up self-medicating, I mean, the, the, the typical kind of thing is that in order to deal with a psychological problem, they look for help somehow without going for help, mm-hmm. and they take drugs to try to either help them sleep or not sleep or whatever it might be. Um, and that very often, that alcohol or that drug abuse very often can lead you to criminal activity. Um, one of the points I do want to make also, though, is these are guys and girls who went o- overseas or who went into the military to protect our country and to sacrifice potentially their lives, like Mark, who had the best of intentions mm-hmm. and who went there for All the really right good things and for mm-hmm. right reasons. And to no fault of their own, wind up doing their job. Mm-hmm. But part of that job is this training, which is important because that's how they stay alive mm-hmm. and that's how they can fight. Mm-hmm. But part of that tr- that job is also that psychological trauma that they have to face in killing, in being, seeing buddies being killed, all the, tra- all the horrors of war, that's part of what they get that they didn't necessarily sign up for. And when they come back, it, it, they pay the price for it. And we have to be conscious of that in the criminal justice system the defense part of the criminal def- the criminal justice system has to be educated and informed about this problem that's coming into our criminal justice system. Very often, not only the defense, but also the jurors, our public, have to be informed because PTSD, for many people, is like a get-out-of-jail-free card if you're going to claim that mm-hmm. as a reason or as a defense. It's not. It's, a, it's actually um, a, a way to address the actual problem so that it can be treated. And so the person, instead of throwing them into a cage and having them come back, back out the same person, if not worse, mm-hmm. you're actually treating the person so they can come back into society. The melding of the veterans back into society 
is the goal, I would think, of any mm-hmm. society. And in order to do that, the criminal justice system has to be uh, alerted to this particular part of of, of, um, of crim- criminality that's taking place. For sure. And and that's something that it's so important that you're bringing awareness to. And it's, it is hard for people to understand that. Um, I happen to understand I had post-traumatic concussive disorder where I've spent years dealing with repercussions after having just a concussion. I can't imagine because I've heard that if you're getting a concussion or some kind of concussive trauma while you're in stress, it's even, you know, more emphasized. I mean, we could go into all of those things. But I wanted to ask you, Mark, because you're here on this show, Crazy Amazing Humans, and we're really wanting to inspire our audience and help our audience understand how people who do go through hard things or who are helping people, go. how do you get through a day? I came back from my last deployment in 2013 from Afghanistan. Um, you know, for the first time in my life, six months after I came back, I, I began using street narcotics. You know, I'd never used drugs or alcohol in my entire life leading up to that point. And so that in itself was a um, was a red flag. It should have been a red flag to me right away. But I didn't really catch on to it as quickly. So what happened was I, I began self-medicating with street drugs. And w- within, you know, six months, I was um, selling the drugs to support my own habit. And that uh, carry that habit continued, behavior continued for another you know year and a half to two years before um, I was ultimately arrested by the LAPD uh, for a drug crime, and um, I was forced to face my consequences. You know, and at that point, um, you know, I was I was so lost in the grips of my addiction that I didn't I didn't really realize what, what how bad my life had spiraled out of control. Um, but the day that I got arrested was probably the best day of my life because it was actually a, the one way that I got rescued. Instead, you know, I, I look at it as a rescue, being rescued, not arrested type thing. I love that. Yeah. That is fantastic. So, um, so really, um, I was placed into the Veterans Court program in LA County, and um, which is a great uh, Veterans Court program with uh, Judge Judge Tynan. I just uh, graduated that court program on uh, January sixth. Oh, so finally, yeah, it was a long. Uh, I've been in that program for quite a while, but uh, we're going to be adding that to the film. So. Oh, really? That's wonderful. Fabulous. And um, what did they do? What did you do in that program? So the Veterans Court program uh, here, anyway, is set up so that uh, they veterans who need rehabilitation or PTSD treatment can be sent to the the West LA VA domiciliary or other treatment centers to receive the treatment that, that they need. And instead of, um, you know, throwing the veterans into, into a cell for their crimes, they're given the opportunity to get help and seek treatment uh, for the root cause of what caused, the, you know, the criminal behavior in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the veterans that I know who are in a similar situation that I'm in um, are, are not, you know, career criminals they're not they don't come from bad families or bad hometown you know they had they're just like me you know they came with with a good you know um um, a good background yeah good background good good intentions intentions. right good intentions and it's just when you get out of the military um there's a consistent theme in, in all of us is that we all came back different people um, you know, in all my legal issues, I've had several people write me letters, and, and almost every letter that I've, I've read, they all say the same thing. Mark, when he came back home, he was a changed person. He was a changed person. And um, mm-hmm. so, uh, yeah. yeah. And if you think sure. about it, how could how you could not it, be? How could you yeah, not be changed? Yeah, exactly right. Well, Jeff, so let me ask you, uh, through this process and all the people that you've encountered and uh, the time you spent on this issue, what can you see that we can actually say, we can celebrate. What are some good things that are happening? Uh, certainly awareness through your film and other ways, but so what are some other good things that you've seen that we can maybe celebrate right now? Well, I think one of the things that's happening is that these veterans courts that Mark was part of um, are proliferating throughout the country. Um, there are, I think, over 400 now um, doing this kind of um, Restorative justice, I guess you could call it, because they're restoring the veterans and they're and they're they're meeting out justice mm. at the same time. There are also uh, in several states um, efforts to rewrite the sentencing laws for veterans, um, so that again, like I was saying, where the defense and the judges and the prosecution and the jurors have to be educated about the fact that there's something different here 
than their, the usual situation. And so they're trying to, and I think in Minnesota and Virginia and Florida, Kentucky, I think as well, they're rewriting their sentencing laws for veterans who might have committed crimes but suffer from PTSD or traumatic brain injury. Um, there are also, uh, one of the things that's happened is that we never really take stock of who is admitted into a prison who might be a veteran. So there's really no concrete number. There's really no exact statistic. There's no data as to who are veterans in our criminal justice system. Mm. There are efforts now to try to identify those people mm. and to give those people um, defense attorneys. And there are programs out there and there are organizations out there trying to raise money for those defense attorneys or at least to give those veterans um, information about where they are in the criminal justice system. What are some of those organizations you like? Well, a couple a couple of the organizations that off the top of my head I can think of was like the one that I was in, for instance. Uh, there's a lot of these organizations that are popping up that are um, seeking out to help the veterans that are that are suffering from these these things that we're going through. Uh, the program that I was in uh, is from the PTSD Foundation of America. It's located in Houston, Texas. Uh, I was at Camp Hope. It's a six to eight month program um, intensive PTSD treatment program. Where it's all peer to peer. You know, that's that that's the uh, the best part about that program is it's all combat veterans I'm there with. You know, a lot of the guys I served with over in this you know same country, same time, um, same branch of service and everything. So uh, that's that's one. You know, there's another program out of New York I know of called the New York Veterans Defense Program that does help veterans. They uh, you know they take certain cases on each year for veterans that are involved with criminal activity and they 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 give them lawyers pro bono and they take the case in the court and defend them and everything and a lot of good resources come out of that so there's a lot of programs like that all over the country um that are popping up you know despite all the the problems that we've been having that's wonderful i i, I mean i can't say because i can't tell you specifically the uh -huh. the name of the organization that's here in los angeles that is helping to provide lawyers, uh, defense lawyers for, for veterans. But I can tell you, there's an organization called Justice for Veterans, um, mm -hmm. out of um, I believe out of Virginia, um, and they are primarily involved in creating and, and promoting um, veterans courts around the country. Mm -hmm. um, and there's another organization called Veterans Defense Project in Minnesota, which is also involved in helping state legislatures write these sentencing laws, rewrite these sentencing laws. Fabulous. That's fantastic. And Mark, I just want to talk a little bit about how you've started a company, the drone. And can you just tell people how you've moved forward? And Yeah. Um, so after I started getting uh, the help that I needed, um, I started to actually make a turnaround. Um, I began to make progress in my life, of course. You know, I'm, I'm currently enrolled in college. I'm getting ready to start college classes in the fall. Um, I started my own my own drone business about uh, about a year and a half ago um, it called it Persistent Aerial Productions and I basically it's uh, along the same lines of what I was doing with the Department of Defense in Afghanistan I just kind of took that and molded it into my own um, uh, business um, I flew UAVs in Afghanistan to uh, um, spy on the enemy and so I got that's where I got the idea from and I there's a I did some research and there's a huge market for it so um, that's what I began to work on uh, lately is just you know getting my business off the ground and and is it out of Los Angeles? Currently, currently and it tell is. Tell me yeah. the name of again so everyone can hear it. It's called Persistent Aerial Productions. Nice. I love and that. it's okay, and it's Mark's services, work and his company that supplied the aerial photography that we use in the film. Is it fun to fly these? Things? It is fun. And that's why I like doing it so much because they always say you know if you, if you do something that you love doing you know you be you don't you won't work a day in your life. And I, lo I love doing it. So that's, that's fantastic. Now, you're gonna have to see the film to appreciate this, but mm. you'll see Mark as a different man mm -hmm. in the film. Yeah, I mean it's for me it's remarkable. I haven't seen him now for six, seven, eight months or so, but it's a it's it's he was always the man who could start a company that specializes in aerial photography and make it work. But when you see him in the film, you'll see a totally different man, and this is who he really is. Right. That's so yeah. amazing. Wow. I'm so glad that that program was successful and that you're on the road to complete recovery. Yep. And just circling back to the film, just give us our, you know, the pitch for our audience to watch your film. And Well, I mean, the film is, I think, I mean, biasedly, I guess. <laughs> um, the film is uh, three remarkable stories about three remarkable guys. Um, it's... It's a. It's basically a, um, a courtroom drama in a way, because we got incredible access to two 
murder trials in the courtroom, which we follow from beginning to end. And you have three different stories about three different kinds of veterans with three different kinds of traumatic um, events that happened to them and the, combat trauma and how they worked their way through the justice system. So it's a kind of a, a drama and a, a documentary and a um, heartfelt kind of family story, too, because mm. of one of the veterans who's in there. Uh, their family has to go through that. That's mm. the other, you know, those are the other victims and the costs in addition to, to, to money and, and revenue from the state and whatnot, but the cost to families mm-hmm. of these veterans who yeah, come back changed sure. and wounded. Mm. Right. It's he a substantial cost. A couple kids, right. Let's see. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, speaking uh, of families, uh-huh. if I may just interject, you are a grandfather. I am uh-huh. a grandfather. Hey, congratulations yes. on Thank that. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I, we just are so thankful you guys are here. And Jeff, I wanted to say, I was saying this before, that given your story and how you were teaching fourth and fifth graders in Harlem, mm-hmm. and then you moved to San Francisco and you're teaching uh, cultural awareness, that spirit permeates your work, whether mm-hmm. you're a filmmaker or not, but it's certainly in this film. We've both enjoyed seeing the film. Yeah, we love the film. Uh, in fact, there's a song that we have in the, in the yeah, film. We were so inspired. Let us take a stab at writing a song for right. the film. We're and it's ever great. so grateful. And we were great. so inspired by so, your work. Yeah. And that's what it came out. So I just want to thank say you. thank you for bringing your heart and soul into this project. Thank you very much. And just the men and women featured in this film are of great courage. Like you, Mark, we, um, again, are just so honored to have you here today, both of you honored and privileged, and thank you for your service to our country. Thank you very much. And beyond the work you're doing now. Absolutely, and so uh, make sure you, if Uh you can, go Mm -hmm. see this film, Those Who Serve. Uh, So it's being made and marketed independently. Please check out the Kickstarter page because that has got a great backstory on yeah, my man. And your page. Facebook page as mm-hmm. well. It, those what, who serve. Those who serve on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Uh, links to both of those will be on our website. We're pulling for you. Thank you. Exactly. Appreciate Thank it. you both so Thank much. You Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's not the same child. Those days are gone. He's walked alone. So that's our podcast. We want to thank filmmaker Jeff Werner and Marine veteran Mark Stillian from the documentary Those Who Serve for being with us today, sharing their story, and enlightening us on a very powerful and important issue. Mm. If you've enjoyed today's podcast and you think it would be helpful for someone you know, please be a crazy amazing human and let them know about us. And if you know of someone who's specifically suffering from PTS, you will find links on our YouTube channel below this episode. A couple of quick reminders. We definitely want to hear from you and stay connected. So make sure and sign up for our newsletter by sending us an email at crazyamazinghumans at gmail.com. That's crazy amazing humans, all one word, at gmail.com. We'd also love to hear your comments, questions, and suggestions. In fact, if you know of a story about a crazy amazing human that's making a difference in the lives around them, please let us know about them. We just might highlight them on our next podcast. Right. So make sure to subscribe to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We've also videotaped the podcast, so you can check us out on the Crazy Amazing Humans YouTube channel. That's right. And most of all, we want to make sure to thank you for being with us today. Remember that every little kindness has the potential to create crazy, amazing human experiences one person at a time. So this week, we want to encourage you to find one thing that you can do to extend kindness and love in the world. I'm Jefferson Denham. And I'm Katrina Carlson. See you next time on the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast. I want you to feel, I want you to feel.